Welcome back to our second video on sex education in New Jersey. I'm Lori Kirkendall, and these videos are sponsored by the New Jersey Family Policy Center. In this session, we will look closer at New Jersey's comprehensive health and physical education learning standards. These new academic standards were adopted by the New Jersey State Board of Education in January of 2020. Their implementation was delayed until this 2022 and 2023 school year. It's helpful to understand the difference between standards and curriculum. Standards are the knowledge and skills children are to learn and be able to demonstrate. Curriculum is the teaching materials and strategies for helping them do so. Standards are what is to be taught and curriculum is how it is to be taught. Standards are set at the state level by the State Board of Education. And in New Jersey, this board is appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the state Senate. The 13 members of the SBOE oversee the Commissioner of Education. Curriculum is set down at the local level in a decentralized approach, giving local school boards the adoption authority for their district's students. Curriculum is developed by teachers and administrators with input from the community to reflect the values of the local community. The new standards are easy to find on the state's website. If you go to nj.gov slash education slash standards, you'll see all the subject areas. And then you can click into the Comprehensive Health and Physical Education Standards. The standards are grouped into four different grade level bands, kindergarten through second, third through fifth, and then middle school and high school. There are three standards, personal and mental health, physical wellness, and safety. We will focus on personal and mental health, which is further broken down into disciplinary concepts that include personal growth and development, pregnancy and parenting, emotional health, social and sexual health, and community health services and support. Let's look at a few of the most concerning performance expectations. First, by the end of second grade or for seven and eight year olds, we have list medically accurate names for body parts, including genitals. Several concerns here. Accurate terms for genitals is not well defined, opening the door for many graphic terms and pictures to be shown in these earliest grades. Many would agree these aren't age appropriate classroom discussions or discuss the range of ways people express their gender and how gender role stereotypes may limit behavior. We might argue these are complex topics for these young children, but it also opens the door to subjective ideological ideas about gender identity. You can see here from the glossary the many terms related to gender identity. Let's look at a few from the next grade band, grades three through five or eight to 11 year old children. Here are three of the performance expectations from personal growth and development. They have chosen not to use the terms male and female when discussing puberty. And you'll note the common topics of romantic and sexual feelings and masturbation. In social and sexual health, we find differentiate between sexual orientation and gender identity. Referring back to the glossary terms, these words can be used in many concerning abstract and subjective ways, which young concrete brains cannot understand. Going on into middle school, by the end of grade eight, describe pregnancy testing, the signs of pregnancy and pregnancy options, including parenting, abortion, and adoption. 2.1.A.SSH2 is particularly concerning, says develop a plan for the school to promote dignity and respect for people of all genders, gender identity, gender expressions, and sexual orientations in the school community. This kind of advocacy or making children become advocates is common in comprehensive sex ed. Students can be forced to advocate for something they may not agree with or fully understand. 2.1.8.SSH.9 says define vaginal, oral, and anal sex. You can imagine what this conversation might look like in a middle school classroom of 13 year olds. How about identify short and long-term contraception and safer sex methods that are effective and describe how to access and use them, e.g. abstinence and condom. There are so many concerns in this one. Abstinence is not a safer sex method to be considered along with condoms. They are advocating for contraception use, which advocates for sexual activity among middle school students. Up at the high school level, the advocacy piece goes beyond a promotion plan to advocate for school and community policies and programs that promote dignity and respect for people of all genders, gender expressions, gender identities, and sexual orientations. The AIDS Prevention Act of 1999 requires sex education programs to stress abstinence 
and stress that abstinence from sexual activity is the only completely reliable means of eliminating the sexual transmission of HIV AIDS and other STDs and of avoiding pregnancy. The new health and sex education standards fail to stress abstinence and they fail to provide adequate focus on the risks of sexual activity, including STDs, as well as the mental, emotional, and social risks of sexual activity. You can see why we need parents and policymakers to be aware of the concerns of the new standards. In our next session, we will discuss positive responses and action steps. For more information, please contact New Jersey Family Policy Center at njfpc.org. Thank you for joining us.